All right, uh, welcome everyone here. Uh, uh, it's fantastic to see all of you show up in, you know, and we have kind of a large audience here. The room is full. Uh, this is a um, uh, uh, special uh, this, uh, master's defense. Um, we have, um, you know, uh, one significant and two small collaborations going on with um, the next group, uh, led by uh, Remy, and uh, uh, this is the kind of first uh, concrete uh, milestone in the sense of doing anybody uh, uh, master's thesis or such. I am sure there will be PhD dissertations coming along later on also. So here um, uh, with uh, committee members, uh, that includes Remy and Amitava, uh, I'm happy to have uh, Fadi's defense here. Fadi, take on. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah, and thank you everyone for attending my thesis defense today. Uh, my name is Fadi Kalash, and today I'll be talking about my thesis entitled A Semantic Web Approach to Fault-Tolerant <clears throat> Autonomous Manufacturing. Just as a quick outline of what we're uh, going to go through today, we're going to start out with a small introduction talking about a manufacturing as a whole and what exact, what exact concept in manufacturing we're going to be looking at. Then we're going to move on to the literature review and look at the different implementations and works that have actually tackled these kind of concepts and what kind of gaps are available for us to look at and try to improve on. Then we're going to move on to the methodology and implementation where we'll talk about the different contributions that we've worked on throughout this thesis and how they tackle those gaps. Finally, we'll conclude and tie it all back into the manufacturing sector. Before we begin, I'm going to talk a bit about myself. Uh, so I graduated with a bachelor's in mechatronics engineering from my uh, home country in Lebanon from the Lebanese American University. I originally come from a city in the south coast of Lebanon called Saido. And then I moved here about two years ago to start my master's in computer engineering, where I started working in both the AI Institute and in the next feature factories team. Some of my hobbies include cooking, theater and soccer. In fact, every Saturday morning, you can find me on my couch watching my favorite soccer team, Arsenal Football Club. <laughs> All right, so let's begin. As a small introduction about manufacturing, I'm going to talk uh, specifically about downtime in manufacturing and how that affects uh, facilities all around. But what exactly is downtime? So downtime is essentially the period of time where your production line is halted, where all the machines and equipment are, are paused and there's no products being made uh, at that specific period of time. Uh, downtime can, be, can lead to some serious disadvantages in manufacturing facilities from decreased efficiency of your production and which leads to insufficient production as a whole and of course lost revenue. However, how much lost revenue are we really talking about? Well, according to some sources, uh, there are about, uh, if we're going to look specifically at the automotive manufacturing industry, right? There are about 800 hours of downtime per year uh, for each manu uh, automotive manufacturing facility. Now, if you take into account that each minute of downtime can cost up to $22,000 uh, $22, of lost revenue, then we're talking about, about $1.05 billion of lost revenue throughout a calendar year. And that's just the automotive manufacturing industry. However, if you want to look at manufacturing as a whole, then this can lead up to uh, $50 billion per, of lost revenue per year. And as such, this is a topic that needs to be addressed in manufacturing and how can we help minimize this sort of downtime to able to minimize this cost in revenue. And that's when uh, we start to have to look at the causes of downtime. What are the causes of it and how can we look at uh, tackling these causes? Some, uh, some common causes for downtime include improper planning, uh, which essentially whether you have resources that are improperly distributed or job scheduling that has not been uh, studied and inefficient. Uh, some another cause could be human error where your own technician or, or any human uh, worker within the facility caused any error with your equipment. It could be from insufficient inventory since you have uh, resources that are not available when, are, when they are needed. It could also be from external factors, whether it be a cyber, whether it be cyber attacks. So if you have an external agent 
who tries to attack your facility that has to be halted to make sure that all the equipment is safe and can, can, can continue production as required. And it could be from employee shortages, whether you don't have enough technicians working the line and being able to continue with each operation. And finally, it could be from machine failure. Now, machine failure would be essentially be whether you have a piece of equipment or an asset that has malfunctioned or is not functioning correctly. It can be two different equipment that have collided and cannot work properly anymore. And so in this thesis, we're going to focus mainly on machine failure and how we how can we minimize downtime that is caused by machine failure. And this is where we're going to start going to our literature review and see what kind of works have uh, been implemented that can help uh, minimize this downtime from machine failure. So this literature review is split up into three different sections. The first section is the is look looks at smart manufacturing. Now a brief introduction about smart manufacturing. Uh, this is essentially a term that's coined that looks at how we can intersect the traditional operational technology in a manufacturing facility, and that can go from anywhere from the programmable logic controller, which is your brain of your uh, production line, or to any robotic actuators or any sort of equipment that has been around in manufacturing for a long time now, and how that can intersect with the new and emerging informational technology, which introduces uh, processing capabilities onto your manufacturing shop floor. Now, this can include uh, new processing devices that are introduced, or it, can, uh, or it can also introduce new theoretical concepts, such as digital twin and the virtual world in general. So the digital, digital twin essentially is a replica, a virtual replica of your physical facility that can be used to analyze and process different data and come up with uh, more knowledgeable decision making. So. Smart manufacturing is the intersection of these two paradigms to come up with new capabilities uh, for your manufacturing facility based on these new technologies that are being introduced. One specific, one specific topic in smart manufacturing that we're looking at is edge computing. Edge computing is a new concept that is emerging in smart manufacturing, which introduces edge devices onto your manufacturing shop floor. These edge devices are hardwired into your facility and have the capability for very minimal processing. However, one of the, the great advantages of edge computing is the real time capabilities of processing your data due to minimal lag in data communication. If you look onto, into this diagram over here, traditionally what would happen if you want to analyze or process data with all the data that's generated on your manufacturing line would be sent up to the cloud where it's processed and then decisions can come up from there using whatever algorithm you decide and then the data will be sent back down to the shop floor however this presents some issues such as lag in communication and so a new uh, paradigm was introduced which is edge computing and this comes uh, this is introduced in the middle layer between your shop floor and your cloud where data can go straight to your edge device, be processed, and either be sent up to the cloud or data can go back into your shop floor. So this new uh, paradigm introduces two-way communication as well. Within literature, there have been some prominent use cases of edge, edge devices and edge computing in general, so, uh, some of which I've highlighted in this slide as well, which includes real-time analytics. So like I said, one of the advantages of edge, the edge computing is the ability for real-time processing. And so different works have looked at what kind of analytics can be produced at the edge layer throughout with these resource-constrained devices that can help improve your manufacturing efficiency. It could be job scheduling, where you have data generated at the shop floor, it's sent to the edge uh, layer and then this and then different algorithms can be used to dynamically allocate resources as required. And finally, anomaly detection where the data that's being sent to the edge device can uh, be detected for any outliers and thresholds and alerts can be sent to technicians in near real time. Now, the second uh, section in this literature review is going to be the semantic web concept. Uh, semantic web essentially is an effort that helps to uh, increase the interoperability of data and information between different equipment and machine. And this deals really with the contextualization of data uh, and abstraction of data. So uh, one thing that I really that uh, one example that I try to always explain in uh, semantic web is uh, how can we really 
adopt semantic web in manufacturing? What is a simple example to showcase the advantages of it in a manufacturing environment? And this is really a, uh, a, a very simple example of how it can be adopted. So we're going to be using the data information, knowledge and wisdom uh, pyramid. We start out with the raw data that's generated on your shop floor. It could be a value of 3,500. And this is just raw data, and which is why it's at the bottom layer. However, once we start abstracting this data and contextualizing it, we can achieve the second layer, which is the information layer. Uh, this is when we start to connect this data with uh, entities on your shop floor. So in our example, we're going to connect the value of 3,500 to sensor one, which is on robot one. So now we know that this value which we're getting this raw data value, which we're getting from our shop floor, is actually coming from this, uh, this unique entity that we have, which is robot one. And this, uh, this uh, procedure is called semantic annot annotation, which is where you take your raw data and then contextualize it and produce information. Now, now that we have information, we can, we can abstract it one layer further into the knowledge, into the knowledge layer, where this is where we can start deducing implicit knowledge which isn't uh, which isn't available to us uh, with, with any other technology so in our example we can say robot one since robot one is giving us a value of 3500 then robot one gripper is closed so this is a status of our gripper that is not usually available to us however we can deduce it using the technologies that we have in semantic web and finally now that we have this implicit knowledge we can use it I mean, since we know that robot one gripper is closed, we can say that, uh, well, now that we clo it's closed, we're going to make a decision out of it and continue our path. And this is where the wisdom layer comes in. Now, within Semantic Club, of course, there are technologies to be used. And one uh, very prominent one is the use of resource description framework, which is a modeling language that helps us link our different entities together. Essentially, the diff uh, essentially uh, in RDF, you create triples which uh, connect different entities together. You have the object and the value connected together with it by the attribute, which, what, which is what creates a triple. Now, as you can see, there are two parts in this diagram, however. The top part is the schema, which defines your ontology. It, it's, uh, it's very similar, whoever is, uh, uh, knows more, much about coding, it's very similar to creating a library, for example. Of, and then once you create the library and you have the methods inside of it, this is when we start instantiating our uh, methods and variables. In our example here, however, since we have the schema, then we can create an instance of it where an object is connected to the value through its attribute. And this is how we can create triples using RDF. And in our example here, we do have two separate triples, sensor one with the value of the sensor and then sensor one with robot one. Now, what kind of works in Semantic Web have been done in a manufacturing sense? Uh, from the works that we've seen throughout the research, we can split up the works into three separate sections. The first one deals with semantics and IoT, which, which essentially looks at what are the different hardware requirements that are required to be able to integrate semantic technologies into, uh, into manufacturing. What, uh, what sort of processing capabilities do we need? And what kind of uh, communication protocols are required that, can, that are capable of sending such uh, data between different equipment. The second section is for the semantic annotation section. So if we remember in semantic annotation, that's where we go from the data layer to the information layer. And uh, in semantic, most of the works in semantic annotation deal with what kind of models should we use, what kind of syntax is required and so on. And based on that, that's where we go to the third section, which is the ontologies. What kind of ontologies do we have to adopt in manufacturing that can help us uh, increase the interoperabil interoperability of this information between our different uh, between our different equipment? And uh, such ontologies include the semantic sensor network, which we were going to uh, talk about in this, which we decided to adopt in this thesis. And finally, the third section is the autonomous manufacturing section. And as a quick introduction, these are three different definitions that I was able to find about autonomous manufacturing. We're not going to go through each of them. However, one thing to deduce from this is that is, is how different definitions were introduced for this um, for this concept and whether it be for autonomous decision making or autonomous communication or for optimizing production. 
However, autonomous manufacturing does have its own benefits, and, and this kind of explains why we want to look into autonomous manufacturing as a concept to introduce into our manufacturing facility. One such uh, benefit is to keep up with ever-changing market demands. So, for example, if you have uh, supply, if you have a certain product that suddenly has great demand for it, how is your facility going to react to this increase in demand, and how can it allocate its own resources to be able to produce the quota that it needs to keep up with this demand? And then based on that, we can also deduce that we can increase our productivity from autonomous manufacturing. And since this and since this uh, concept introduces less human intervention, then it can also uh, lead to minimizing human errors within a production facility and, of course, uh, creating safer production lines for humans. Now, since autonomous manufacturing deals a lot with decision making, then a lot of the implementations in literature have kind of uh, focused on the traditional machine learning algorithms, whether it be supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. However, talking about the approach is not enough. We also want need to talk about what are the different characteristics that these uh, these implementations have looked at achieving, and that's where we've characterized some uh, characteristics for autonomous uh, manufacturing, which includes self-organization. So once you have a new uh, job order coming down onto your production facility, then your autonomous system is capable of taking this job order and then uh, allocating resources at runtime to be able to come up, to be able to produce whatever is required in, uh, within the specified period of time that it is needed to. And then there is flexible manufacturing, which essentially uh, explains how you can introduce new equipment and new assets into your production line uh, in a very seamless fashion. This kind of ties back into the whole plug and play uh, concept where you can introduce a new, a new piece of equipment. It talk, uh, the, this equipment can announce to the different uh, assets in your production line about its own capabilities and, and as such, uh, its resources are allocated to it and different operations are given. And finally, there is fault tolerance which essentially uh, explains how an autonomous manufacturing system is capable of overcoming obstacles uh, within its uh, line, such as equipment malfunction or any collision, and being able to continue production even with uh, this, even with these malfunctions, uh, even when these malfunctions occur. And in our thesis, as you've probably uh, deduced by now, in our thesis, we're going to focus mainly on the fault tolerant aspect of autonomous manufacturing. Now, what are different works that have looked at these uh, characteristics? Well, during the literature review, we were able to gather about 35 uh, works that uh, all work towards autonomous manufacturing and categorize these works to see what are the different, what are, what, where has a lot of focus been placed and what is still required. So as you can see from this diagram over here, about 65% of the works have actually focused on self-organizing and dynamic scheduling of a production line and 27% have focused on flexible manufacturing. However, only 8% have actually looked at how you can have a fault tolerant uh, production line. And that is why... Uh, oh, sorry? Uh, these, are, these are works that I was able to gather throughout uh, while I was doing the literature review and categorizing them uh, oh, so according... Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then finally, as a quick summary of autonomous manufacturing, we wanted to look at what are the different trends in the in the research, and you can see here that uh, we were able to gather about a thousand autonomous manufacturing papers and extract the different keywords from these papers. Uh, for a keyword to appear in this diagram over here, it must have appeared in at least ten uh, published papers, and any linkage between them means that they have been uh, available in the same that they were in the same paper at uh, some instant. And one thing to take out from this diagram is the lack of semantic web uh, and, and semantic web or keywords here, with only probably ontology being uh, showing up. However, uh, this kind of shows that there is a bit of lack in the works in semantic web within manufacturing, or at least it has not been as prominent as other sections. And so, after we've looked at all these three, uh, after we've looked at all these three sections, what are the gaps that we've able to realize? Well, like I said before. There is a bit of lack of works in fault tolerance. Only 8% of the papers that were gathered were actually looking at fault tolerance. Uh, and so this is one gap that this thesis looks to tackle. There's also, there's also been a lack of end-to-end -end use case for semantic web in manufacturing. And that's and when I talk about end-to-end, -end, meaning how we have they gone from raw data to annotated 
and then uh, being able to deduce knowledge and actually use this knowledge to be able to create decisions. And finally, there's also a lack of work which utilizes uh, heterogeneous data, whether it be from different types of sensors or from different uh, from different sources, whether it be public domain or and your gen uh, locally generated data. And this is where we're going to move into our third section, which is the methodology and implementation. Before we begin, we're going to describe what is the specific use case that we that we have created that Semantic Web can help us uh, improve manufacturing in. So within the future factories lab, we do have this setup where you have a robot essentially that does need to pick up that needs to pick up a part from one location and then move it to the second location. This can be considered one job order, for example. And uh, however, uh, for this to for this to occur, we will need our equipment on the shop floor layer to, on the equipment layer to be able to communicate with each other and be able to send signals from one piece of equipment to another to make sure that the process is is moving along as planned. So what happens is the the, uh, the PLC, which essentially is the brain of our uh, manufacturing cell, okay, will send a signal to the robot that it needs to go to this location. Once the robot goes to this location, then it is also told to close its gripper to pick up the part. And then to move forward, the PLC needs to find out when the gripper is actually closed. And that is why we have a sensor on our on the end effector of our robot, which is called a potentiometer. So this potentiometer actually gives us a value, a different value when the gripper is open and closed. And from that, we're able to know whether a gripper is open or closed. And if it's closed, then the PLC can send the, the uh, then the uh, then the robot can send a signal back to the PLC, letting it know that we can move forward with the job. However, what would happen if the potentiometer malfunctions? Is the job going to stop or it should be halt the production? Well, this is what we're going to look at in our thesis. How can we uh, overcome this obstacle of a malfunctioning potentiometer to be able to move forward with this, uh, with this job? And this is where we've broken up our use case into different parts. First part essentially is to uh, is to actually read the data from the robot and the controller and then be able to gather this raw sensor data. So now we were able to gather, in our example, we're able to gather the potentiometer data to see what the value is. Now we need to start to include and in, in, introduce semantic web technologies. And this is where we where we have to annotate the data and create information out of it. And after that, you integrate this information into this into a knowledge graph. This knowledge graph will, will contain domain knowledge and manufacturer specifications about your sensor, which we'll delve into further details about. And then after, after we've had all our information in one central location, which is our knowledge graph, we can apply reasoning mechanisms, query through the knowledge graph, and the, create a decision on how to move forward with our operation. However, to, to be able to create this, I've split up uh, the requirements for this use case into two separate parts. First one is the infrastructure requirements, which essentially uh, uh, contains the parts highlighted in yellow. And in our infrastructure requirements, this is when we're going to talk about what, how we created the test bed and what are the different capabilities of our future factories test bed. And to make things easier, I've split up the equipment that we have into three separate layers. The first layer is the equipment layer, which uh, which essentially uh, uh, contains all your actuating equipment, or uh, your programmable logic controller, any controller for the robots and our conveyor system over here. It also contains the sensors that we have on our robots. So if we uh, if we remember here on our end effector, we do have sensors that help us to realize when the gripper is open or closed. So this over here, you can see it in black, is the potentiometer, which, which changes its value when the gripper opens and closes. And we do have different sensors as well. We also have wireless uh, sensors uh, throughout the lab that can give us data on temperature readings and vibration of our conveyor system. However, before moving on to the next layer, there is one certain uh, platform and technology that we need to introduce that helped us create this equipment layer, which is uh, Siemens Technomatics Process Simulate. Uh, this is a platform that, uh, that essentially creates uh, the digital twin of our uh, manufacturing facility. However, we've, uh, we have not been able to achieve the full capabilities of digital twin yet, but we're going to talk about what are, different, how, what are the different steps that we've used Process Simulate for in creating our infrastructure. 
First of all, we've used it to actually design the layout of our lab. So before we actually we, before we put the equipment in their physical location, we did obtain different uh, virtual models of them and then place them in different configurations to figure out what is the most optimal configuration for our test bed and that allows minimal or no, no collisions for our robots and increases the reach of the different uh, robots and helps us have more dynamic jobs. And this is this is uh, the virtual replica of it. You can see in this picture over here. And uh, once we were once we created this model in the virtual world, we uh, we created our physical infrastructure, which is looks which has the same exact configuration as you see up here. The second uh, the second uh, step that we use process simulate for was to actually create the jobs, and this is where. Uh, you use Prosimate to program your robots and be able to uh, move them from one location to another. And then once you actually create the job, you can download that job to the real robot. Now, traditionally, to be able to teach your robot to complete such jobs, it would take hours where you'd have to move the robot physically from one location to another. However, with the introduction of this kind of technology, we've decreased the time to create these jobs from hours to maybe one hour at most for more complex jobs. And of course, tying this back to our fault tolerance use case, we were able to create the different jobs that we needed for our use case through Process Simulate over here. And finally, the third step that we used Process Simulate for was to actually create the PLC code, which we talked about. So the PLC does, does have a certain logic code that helps your production move forward. And before we actually deploy it onto our physical facility, what we can, what we do is we create the code and then tie it back to our virtual replica over here and make sure that the code works as we intend to. And the great thing about it is once you actually ensure that it works as intended, you can uh, deploy it onto your physical cell and, you, and it will move forward just how you tested it out in your virtual, virtual world. And of course, tying this back to the use case, then virtual commissioning here was used to actually test out the PLC code that we used in our use case. Now moving on to the shop floor layers. So the shop floor layers is, is where we start to introduce uh, processing capabilities uh, into our manufacturing facility. And this can include, uh, this includes the different edge devices that we have in our lab. Uh, some of the edge devices that we have include the Siemens IPC 227E and the Carbon 700. These are two edge devices, of course, each with their different uh, specifications that are hardwired into our PLC system and are capable of reading the different data that we have running in our system. And edge computing here was uh, in in the lab uh, in the Fitch Factories lab. We use edge computing for different uh, for different use cases. Where one certain use case was to actually have an image processing algorithm that can figure out if your tray is, co is correctly configured or not. And then if it's not configured, then the edge device will send a signal back to your production line to stop because there will need there will be need for human intervention to fix the configuration. It's also used for simple data visualization and to send any data that we need up to the cloud. Uh, for our fault tolerance use case, we use edge computing to host the application that we, that we have developed that allows us to annotate our data, which we will get into. And finally, there's the enterprise layer, which essentially includes the server uh, box that we have here with four different racks, each of them with uh, very large computing power. Uh, and we also have the cloud platforms that we use in future factories, which include Siemens MindSphere and IBM's Maximal Application Suite. And right now, some of these uh, platforms are still being configured. However, we do uh, we do use them uh, to store store data, get the data, and for simple visualization at this point. In our fault tolerance use case, it is used for it is essential. Cloud computing is essentially where we do more complex processing that is that we're not able to do at the edge layer. So tying all this together, this is a simple diagram that showcases how the different equipment uh, and the different communication protocols work in our future factories lab. We do have our equipment layer tied into our shop floor layer, which have our, has our edge devices, which ties into our uh, enterprise layer, which is basically where we have our cloud platforms. Now moving on to the second requirement, which is the semantic web requirement. This is where we close the loop in our use case. We've developed these two parts where we can read the data of the robots, where we can have jobs. Now, well, how can we actually process the, the data that, the, that we're reading and create semantic web capabilities uh, to increase, uh, to create this fault tolerant use case that we want to develop? And to do so, 
I've split up the I've split up our implementation into seven different sections. Essentially, we start out with specifying the needed information that we uh, that we need to move forward with our uh, use case. So uh, you can see over here, this is an example of RDF uh, of RDF in our for our use case. The top layer here it utilizes the semantic uh, sensor network ontology, where different objects and different entities are linked together through the different attributes. And then this lower layer is how we instantiated them for our specific use case. So starting from the left, we do have the information that is generated locally. So our sensor can give us a data. Uh, so for example, our sensor gives us a data of 3,500, which we tie back to a measurement entity, which is tied back to our potentiometer entity. So now here we can create, uh, we contextualize our information. We've contextualized our data to uh, from the potentiometer to the actual data value that we have. And then the second column uh, includes the manufacturer specifications. So this essentially lets us know how, uh, what is the output range that our sensor should be giving us, in our case, that our potentiometer should be giving us. So our instance uh, uh, RDF triples here let us know that our potentiometer can, uh, should give us an output in the range of 4,000 to 5,000. And finally, we have the domain knowledge. And in our case here, our domain knowledge is how does our feature factories lab operate? So we can see here that a certain path can be implemented using a potentiometer or it can be in, uh, implemented using a timer. So if we think back to the video of the robot picking up uh, the object, this can be considered the path that we're implementing and it can be used, it can be, uh, it can be done using either the potentiometer which gives us a value, or it can be, or it can use a timer, which is an internal timer in the PLC. And so that way, once the PLC sends a signal to close the gripper, we can wait maybe two or three seconds, and then we ensure that the gripper is closed before we move forward with our path. Now, now that we have our information, that now that we've specified the information that we're going to use in our use case, how are we going to actually annotate the raw data that we're getting uh, from our sensor to create uh, some of this information? And this is where uh, the application that we developed for the edge device comes in. So, uh, and, and the edge device in the Siemens IPC 227E edge device that we have in our lab, we do have, we created a application essentially that lies within it where you have your different uh, equipment sending data to your PLC. And once it does that, the PLC is then sending the data onto the edge device. Within the edge device itself, there is an internal data bus that any application deployed on the data bus is, is able to access. And so this application essentially takes the raw data that is being published from, from, uh, from our shop floor and then processes it, annotates it, and dumps it back onto the data bus to be used for other cases. And essentially, it transforms the JSON objects that the data is uh, read through into RDF triples in XML syntax. The different technology, like I said, the, this, the, this application was deployed on the Edge device. It utilizes the SDM RDF Visor Toolkit, which essentially is an open uh, source toolkit that helps uh, transform uh, raw data to annotated RDF triples. And however, one caveat within this toolkit is that it does require each user to actually create the mapping that's required. And in our sense, we've created the different mappings uh, and created the different triples that we want our toolkit to, that we want our application to output. And this is where you have, you can see, uh, if you remember, we do have two separate triples that we need to create, one linking the potentiometer to the observation, and then one linking the observation to the uh, actual value. And this is where we can see the mapping for the two different triples that we, were able, that we need to output from our raw data. And, uh, and finally, this is done through MQTT communication within the Edge device. That is how you access the data on the data bus and how you publish it back. Sorry? Publish that duration. Uh, yeah. Listen, go back. Yeah. Go back. One more. Yeah, so you have relations, right? Yeah, between nodes. As simple results and et cetera. So how many such relations do you have in the data? It's just these two, uh, two, two triples, yes. Proof of concept. Yes. In reality, there will be many, many. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. This. So this was just created to uh, modeling of uh, you know that this can be done. This kind of things, but uh, in a full fledged implementation. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have so many sensors. You have the uh, you know the interesting thing is that the manufacturer says this is the valid range. 
But the, for the particular process, you said, no, I want a more stricter range. So acceptable range for this process. You want to describe that you'll have to, uh, you, you can specify this here. The, the, the main difference is that uh, if you are to uh, do in the standard syntactic uh, mode, um, you will not be able to, so, so you'll have to just specify this in, a, uh, um, uh, you know, is uh, very low level terms. Here you can say uh, this is elevated, uh, you know, range. Uh, uh, this is above the range. This is the below the range. This is acceptable range. You can define these kind of concepts. Uh, there will be the classes in your knowledge graph and uh, describe so that because you have this ontology and specify the things here. So you can talk about it at a conceptual level, what those things are. And they say, oh, I have an acceptable range for this process, but for this other process, there's different accessibility. I'm giving a high tolerance in this case, I'm giving low tolerance in this case. Those things can potentially be modeled uh, uh, in this, uh, otherwise you will not. Uh, uh, give very, statement. Statement. Yeah, very simple previous question. Since you have a simulator, can I, can I ask a question before you question? Because <laughs> yeah. it's really not common for us if you ask him questions while he's presenting. Okay. So for us, it's mm -hmm. like, it's better that we like, so we, we I'm work, just trying work, to understand. Work. This is how you guys do it in computer science. Yeah. So you can stop and like interact yeah, and yeah, ask yeah. questions. Yeah. Because if it is not clear, then you know, waiting till the end. Is, uh, Last, uh, one, one. Yeah, but you might describe okay, anyway, no, his process as well. Go on, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so once we we're able to create this application, then we actually need to deploy it onto our edge device. And these are some metrics that you can see from the CPU usage to the data storage requirement for the application that we developed. And finally, now that we're able to annotate, semantically annotate the data that we have, we can start to integrate all this to one centralized knowledge graph. So this is just an example of the raw data that we get from the PLC and what kind of output you can get from the edge device and uh, from the application developed on the edge device where you have the two separate triples uh, connected to each other alongside the actual schema as well. Now that we have the knowledge graph, we can start to deploy reasoning mechanisms onto it. And this is where we move away from the edge device as this requires more processing capabilities. And this was done in uh, essentially what we might call the enterprise layer on a separate machine. And so we've taken the output from the uh, from the application that we developed and then uh, introduced these re reasoning mechanisms. And again, this one is also a simple uh, reasoning where essentially once we read the measurement that we're getting from the potentiometer, if it is outside of the given range, then our potentiometer needs to be changed. And if it is not outside, then we don't need to be changing any potentiometer or any piece of equipment. Once we deployed these uh, algorithms, uh, this mechanism onto our knowledge graph, you can see here a sample of the output from our reasoning engine. So uh, here you can see when uh, that the potentiometer does not need to be changed because it is giving us a value that is within the required range. And this uh, entity was actually created uh, when the engine was deployed onto the knowledge graph. And and this is an example of one year potential or actually does need to be changed. So we've created an entity which contains the attributes view, which contains the value true. And so this way we can figure out the potential is give, it needs to be changed uh, based on the value that we're getting out of which out of it, which is outside the specified range. When we're able to deduce this knowledge, this is now where we have to use this knowledge to create decisions on how to move forward with our process. And this is where another piece of technology is introduced, which is a Spark UL, a query language, uh, which we use to parse through our knowledge graph, figure out if the potentiometer needs to be changed or not. And if it does need to be changed, this was also used to figure out what is the other sensor that we can use to move forward with our process. So you can see here two separate outputs. One of them, if the potentiometer did need to be changed, so if, if the value that was read in our knowledge graph is true, then we also parse through the knowledge graph again and figure out what other sensor do we need to use. Uh, and if it does not to be need to be changed, then the only out output we're going to get is that there's no need to change anything and we can move forward with our path as required. So we've talked about the methodology, implementation and everything. Now let's kind of conclude and tie this back into manufacturing and how we've increased any capability in our manufacturing production line. First of all, we're going to talk about the limitations, however. So uh, as, we've, as we've seen before, that uh, the application that we developed has two major limitations. One of them is the lack of a user interface uh, right now. And so 
any mapping required is, needs to be done by a technician who has knowledge about how the mapping works and is, is capable of writing a uh, resource uh, RDF mapping language. And it also does require uh, have quite quite a bit of computation computational requirement in our resource constrained device, about 11% of the CPU and 1.2 gigs of storage. So this is one aspect that we look to further optimize in the application to be able to use less resources on the on the device. Now onto the contributions itself, we were able to address certain gaps in our literature. The first one is we've able to increase the uh, fault tolerant, uh, we were able to create one more implementation fault tolerance in autonomous manufacturing. So if you remember, fault tolerance wasn't really an aspect that was looked at much. And so in this thesis, we were able to we were able to increase at least the percentage in that. Uh, we were also able to create an end-to-end -end use case for semantic web where we went from the raw sensor data to the knowledge graph and to finally creating a decision based on the knowledge that we were able to acquire and relaying that back to the controller. And finally, we in also... The, in the end to end, you, did you uh, kind of talk about, like, say, production of this, your uh, rocket or something as a whole, or just point-wise for a single or one or two sensors? Uh, it's just for the sensors that we that was introduced so, here. So additional work is necessary, right? For, yes. Like, the whole end to end process. Yes, I, OK. And uh, <laughs> finally, uh, we are able to also address the lack of works that utilize heterogeneous data. In our example, we were able to utilize information from the factory and public information, whether it be the domain knowledge and manufacturer specifications. We also created a standardized data integration process for semantic web in manufacturing. So you can, uh, this is one way that we can start to in, uh, introduce semantic web technologies into manufacturing, whether that be through this specific use case and or through the technologies that we're able to develop, which is introducing it at the edge layer, annotating, and then create and then being able to reason on the knowledge graph. And by doing so as well, we're able to increase the interoperability of data in a manufacturing facility, which is one of the main benefits of using Semantic Club as well, as well as introducing domain knowledge, uh, which is a capability that knowledge graphs are, are, can introduce into your uh, manufacturing facility. Now that we're able to do all these, we can say that this use case can help us reduce uh, the downtime that uh, that we can have that that was introduced into our manufacturing facilities from the malfunction malfunctioning of a sensor, and so we're able to increase our fault tolerance. And finally, the introduction of semantic web into manufacturing can lead us to integrate more diverse data, so start to integrate more sensors than the ones that were used in this uh, in this use case alone, whether it be from analog sensors from cameras, digital sensors, process signals, and so on, and create a larger knowledge graph, which can help us uh, achieve more complex event understanding in manufacturing uh, due to the diverse data that we can integrate into one centralized uh, database. And that concludes uh, the different uh, contributions that this thesis works at. Apart from that, we throughout my time here at the, uh, at the University of South Carolina, uh, and then Future Factories team and the AI Institute team. Uh, I was able to help mentor about 10 or more undergraduate students within the last two years. I have collaborated with industry partners uh, within our team, such as Siemens and IBM. Also collaborated with other educational institutions, whether it be West Virginia University or Clemson University, and given workshops uh, in on Technomatics Process Simulate and the Escawa robot, robot operations in uh, the lab and in, in different classes. And of course, this work would not have been possible without the funding of uh, the two different grants that we uh, we are part of, which is one from the NSF and the other from SCRA. And of course, without the and would have not have been possible without the uh, support of my advisors, Dr. Chef and Dr. Herrick. Thank you very much. So, um... In here, uh, you know, our uh, visiting defense uh, and tradition of now opening up for questions from the uh, for the whole audience. After that is done, the committee may have questions. So go ahead, guys.
Excellent presentation, Toddy. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of um, hardware you were using to run the application when you were talking about the 1.21 gigabytes that I was using at the 11%. Because yeah, that was used on the IPC 227E uh, edge device, given uh, which was created by Siemens. It has about eight gigs of RAM on it, uh, and I can't think on top of my head what processor it has. However, it is a resource constraint device. Thank you. Yep. So one of the you know general uh, challenge also when we try to think about computing aspects in smart manufacturing is that we uh, say, okay, what can be done uh, on the device? What can be done uh, at the next level up? At the fog level, and what can be done at the cloud or enterprise level, and um, one of the possibilities of this method is um, to uh, provide additional control so that you can decide the right place you can do the computation. As an example, you can say uh, only when the data is out of um, range or is an exception pass it on to the next level where the computation will identify what happens, what is the impact on the process, let's say, or the robot arms thing. So instead of passing all the data, you would do a small co computation to say what is the relevant data that should be passed along. So these kind of possibilities arise and your ability to control where you want to do uh, you know, the computation, uh, which is appropriate for the level of computational power you have and the networking of course you have uh, becomes possible. So that's another interesting uh, dimension we not explored fully, but uh, the potential exists by taking the semantic approach. Fine, questions. Yeah, I was just about to address them actually. Um, so we do have two questions on the online chat. Okay. One of them is from Vipula Rauti, mm. uh, and she's asking, uh, are you, uh, so, Regarding the data, are you working on creating or enhancing any manufacturing ontology or uh, just using an existing one? In our case, we are just using an existing one, which is the Semantic Sensor Network Ontology by the W3C uh, uh, Incubator Group. Uh, the second question is, the, uh, my question is about reliability of the timer as an alternative for the potentiometer. If the actuator is not working because of pneumatic issue or motor issue, then even though we give command for a certain time, it may do nothing. Uh, yeah, that is a valid question and it is also a valid point. However, the uh, scope of this thesis looks more towards how Semantic Web can uh, introduce this sort of capability. And even though we've used the timer as the example, there are diff uh, if we have a more complex manufacturing facility, then there might be different sensors to uh, to actually use other than the timer itself. OK, yeah. So my assumption is that uh, with four tolerance, right, you're trying to build some kind of resilience on the system, right? So I, because I heard you say something about the potentiometer possibly failing, at that point, when it does fail, how do you actually bypass? Because I was really interested in hearing how do you bypass that so that there's some kind of redundancy. Yeah, so this is the redundancy that we included over here and the specified information that we got that we used in our uh, use case. So in case the potentiometer does fail, we will use a timer instead. So this kind of introduces this resiliency that you're asking about. As someone who's not very familiar with this work, what would you say based off of your development is the uh, TRL level of your type work? Do you know at all technology readiness level? Uh, I cannot say that I know the answer for that. <laughs> I can't say a three into three we are at right now. Okay. And I mean, the goal is obviously five to six for us and then just the industry, they can go to where else. But I'd say we are at a couple of Thank you. Yes. Hi. This is almost certainly out of scope, but I'm wondering if you can help me think through this problem. What if you have two sensors that are addressing the same issue and they're giving me some token information? What would you do about that problem? Mm. Yeah, that's not something that we've addressed here. However, some possible uh, solutions. Well, in our case, for example, here, 
we don't even address the timer unless required. And so this is not so we haven't really looked at any conflicting issues. Uh, however, one certain uh, way to answer this uh, development is to actually introduce a third level of redundancy, and that way you can create a certain sense of accuracy, like well, if these two are giving this value and then this one's giving that one, then which one you would probably go with the majority, for example. Get into the mechanism yep. of the sensor, and this is a real, a real world problem. Yeah. I mean, his his uh, his work is part of a bigger collective different pieces of the puzzle. And let's say for whatever reason, he did the bad job of that, like this section did a bad job of identifying like which sensors or whatever. Then we also have post execution validation as well that comes back and feeds into the loop. So you have from before and you have post execution as well. One thing that I don't know if you made it clear um, for everyone in the room is that, like, this is a foundational piece of work. This is not, oh, here you go. This is really like the, one of the first building bricks in the infrastructure for everything that's about to come. I mean, like, I look at different places in here, then they are all somehow somewhat connected to the next step uh, of this. So, yeah, I think we'll have. Um, so, you're asking question uh, at a broader level, um, you know, let's say, Revati or Luan and Triple and we are thinking about complex events that are run or uh, exceptions occur that have many different parameters that, you know, the contributing the exception. Now, would it be, would this framework? Lead us to develop a better, uh, you know, uh, and flexible solution, or the way they do it now, which should be just a file and and with the, at the most tags, or CV, uh, you know, or so something like that, right? Uh, uh, so where then you have to pass the data and know the syntax in how it is stored. And create the model uh, before you can start processing. So, if um, you know at the minimum level, here you can think about data being labeled, where the labels are defined in the knowledge graph or on top. At the minimum that level, you get that, right? So, you have data that is more self described as opposed to getting a file. Each, each device, each, uh, you know, produces a different file, different format. This takes away from so the heterogeneity that he mentioned, dealing with that. He, you know, this uh, allows you to handle that. In return, though, there are new problems that are there. For example, the new problems of efficiency. Uh, you uh, create a verbose description such that it is handling heterogeneity, right? But it comes at the cost of certain level of verbosity of RDF syntax, as an example. So there are other alternatives like JSON LD and other things that we may you know, eventually consider. So for that, what do we do? But then there is other trade-off. For example, uh, we can more easily decide which data to transfer from low-powered device or low-powered computation to the higher power. So many you know options are opening up, but there are a lot of, lot of uh, things to be. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't ask this, I got out of the conversation. I'm just looking for a role for future knowledge and more sophisticated knowledge mm -hmm. from involved in the conversation that you do. And that's one place to look. Yeah. And that's one place to look. Yeah. Converting such a conversation. Yeah. 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 So that can tie back into integrating different information into your knowledge graph as well. So the only information that we integrated here was the ones that we required, the bare minimums required to move forward with the use case. But of course, moving forward, the next step is to start to, to increase this and introduce more information, more capabilities, and so on. Uh, this is, like we said, it's like a, the first step, introducing technologies, introducing this capability. 
and uh, of course with that we introduce new problems and but also new solutions <laughs> So Max asks, how would you address a combination of sensor inputs? Say an input from the tensioner telling you where the gripper is, but the load cell telling you. Okay. So that is essentially uh, similar to what we were just discussing when we have different inputs from different sensors. Uh, and as we said, we can. there are different ways of leveraging that or introducing more redundancy to be able to address such issues. Is creating that knowledge graph and annotating all that data an entirely manual process? Do you have to sort of tell the, the, uh, your entire you know, sort of environment, like what this data is, where it's coming from, what are reasonable bounds, or is there any sort of like, automatic learning involved with that? Uh, no, so in our case here, uh, this was an, a manual process. So we did, in, er in order to move from raw sensor data to information, the mapping language was written up by me, essentially, uh, to be able to map the different entities together and then deploy it. And then from this from this sense, uh, the actual data was uh, written out by myself as well. But this is also things that can be uh, automated eventually once you start introducing new processing capabilities that can take in uh, context, uh, textual data and analyzing it and then introducing it into a knowledge graph that can be int uh, integrated with the information that we created. So right now it's manual, but it's the, uh, the complexity that uh, we often don't uh, think about. He used SSN ontology, semantic sensor network ontology. He's an effort that I had initiated in the Bombard Consortium, which has become international standard now. But that only captures the things related to when a sensor uh, uh, collects and creates the data. How do you discard the data? How do you describe this, this kind of sensor characteristic? All those things. But beyond that, you may have a, um, uh, uh, there are existing work on uh, developing manufacturing ontology. But those ontologies would be, you know, would be kind of generic. So when you look at your specific implementation with a digital twin, you'll have to, you can look at that ontology, but you'll have to, Customize it or modify it, but you'd be there'll be some level of views available, but not of the shelf that you completely can use because your uh, you know manufacturing your manufacturing this rocket thing that you're doing is very different than the the pharma industry particular case and all that and so you clearly have to make sure that all of those are you know uh, which was instantiated from a rather high level description of manufacturing process within that itself. Does this a particular representation uh, in the knowledge graph ontology capture the concepts of, let's say, failures or fault tolerance or exceptions or complex events? That is uh, an additional thing that the others would not necessarily have thought through, and then you have to do it yourself. So I have a question about the computational usage of the edge computer. Is that something that, so is that usage during the entire process or does it operate on like a time window where kinematics so, tell us, all right, it's getting close, we should start acting the sensor to see if it's. No, so the way that this operates is the sensor is producing data at all times, right? Whether you are within the job or whether the robot is uh, paused. And so the way the, the application works is at all times, the PLC is reading the data from the potentiometer, and then anytime new data is sent into the uh, application, and then it's transformed, and the knowledge graph is modified to showcase the new value that the potentiometer is showing. And so this is uh, running at all times. It's just constantly working, and this is how we can get more. This is how we're able to introduce this real-time annotation uh, in our facility. So are the cognitive questions alone with Paddy or with the people? Like how do you like to Typically, uh, you know, there may be a uh, little question that committee can do both, uh, you know, with everybody and then we excuse the audience and then come. Similar to us. Yeah. Okay. We usually like to build the candidates alone. 
And rather also one for the first being girls. <laughs> I just want to say like one thing, like I think it's very important for the for the room to to hear. Um, one of the hardest tasks that uh, like is not even represented in all of these slides uh, that Ferdi did is actually the semantics between the world of manufacturing and the world of AI, like the bridge between our group our groups. I think I mean we have a breakthrough in here and how we co like how we understand what each group is doing and what, and this is, this is, this is hard. It's like I'm speaking, you know, if right now I switch and uh, I slurred a couple of words in Lebanese, you know, a couple, couple of folks would understand me, but not everyone, or you can do the same. And I think this is a major contribution that's not showing uh, on fast slides that we're going to build on. I mean, like this is a step, right? towards, you know, we're going to continue the work where you're going to stay, you know, like uh, um, with me on um, this committee for his PhD and we see how this, uh, okay. we see how this grows. Yeah, we... More fun. <laughs> Chapter one. Uh, you also, you came from mechanics, right? Or mechatronics. Mechatronics, yeah. yeah. And uh, in adapted to computer science, and worked in this environment by spending so much time there, uh, you know, at next on, you know, so that is, um, uh, this is the kind of interdisciplinary skill that are going to be in very high demand, that will be high demand, that's the, you know, and not everybody succeeds in doing that. It's, uh, it's, it's daunting uh, to you know, struggle to do <laughs> disciplines, that cultures are different, the work styles are different, the, you know, many styles are very different than mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a few drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it was definitely a great experience uh, working with both groups, the AI Institute and the next, to be able to see a more holistic view of how the different, uh, how the different fields think and evaluate different. Uh, Obstacles essentially. And mostly you have to attend both the meetings, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, with your defense, we are checking a big box in our event, which is on convergence, like on on like multidisciplinary work. Yeah. It's not, you know, I mean, just the mere fact of your presentation and like me feeling, okay, why are they asking a question in the middle of the presentation? This is different. Also, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like all of this, and it's good. Like at least two. Yeah. Also, okay. what more questions do we have? Uh -huh. Okay, so excuse the committee will come out. Next year, that you need to make a in January. Because I'm, but you need Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, I can. 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 I love Should I stop recording? Yeah. Should I stop yeah. recording? Yeah. Oh, in the future, but this is pretty exciting. I don't know if you're familiar with the deep water slides. Can I see that?